welcome to EduSat Network. Friend, as you know, we are having this week lecture on public administration. We have covered the theory part of it, how we can look at the public administration uh, and behavioral approach, socio-psychological approach, and there are other, other methods of looking at public administration. But you all know in the last 200 years, the public uh, administration has gone under uh, new, uh, the sea change and also democracy has gone under sea change. And they both, uh, both are uh, adjusting to each other how to uh, solve the problem of the public and how to take a uh, distinct direction for the uh, solution of the uh, uh, issues of uh, different public interests. So I hope uh, today lecture will have on this aspect how the public administration in 21st century we seen and has studied. A different aspect could be uh, discussed in today lecture and for discussion on this very topic we have in the studio Dr. Satish Shah. He is associate professor at uh, of Department of Political Science, Ram Lala Anand College, University of Delhi, and he has numerous publications to his credit in national, international uh, journals, and also uh, uh, written uh, uh, and his area of interest is political theory, Indian polity, and public administration. So, on behalf, I welcome Dr. Jha for a research lecture on this very topic, public administration in 21st century. Welcome, sir. Thank you, Amrinji. Uh, in fact, uh, today's theme that public administration in 21st century uh, is itself a fascinating topic because uh, the way you know public administration has evolved in the last uh, 200 years is mostly uh, you know considered as a Western enterprise because it was a product of a climate. Uh, which was determined by the industrial revolution and the changes which had taken place in Europe and some of the other western countries. But you know subsequently when there was expansion of international community and the process of decolonization started and countries of Asia, Africa and Latin America attained independence particularly in 40s, 1940s. I think that heralded a new era for the discipline of public administration because what signified what was signified by this development was not simply the advent of the new nation states uh, on the international scene but also at the same time it marked you know the you know marked a new change in terms of uh, the challenges uh, which came to the discipline of public administration and the challenges which were totally new to it. The challenges which were emanating not from the industrial society, the challenges which were emanating not from you know the developed uh, you know societies of the west, but it was coming from a society which was basically undergoing transition. The society which was characterized by deprivation, a scarcity and numerous other problems. Therefore, the public administration at that time like many other disciplines of social science like you know sociology, anthropology, political science, psychology, public administration also try to come to grips with, uh, come to terms with uh, I mean these new uh, issues and new challenges. And therefore, the post second world war period which was also the period of the cold war in international politics was characterized by a you know a kind of rivalry ideological conflict and rivalry in the discipline of social science and you know this conflict acquired a new form the new shape uh, which was basically presented in form of the liberal versus you know the marxist uh, you know conflict in approaches and perspectives now the entire advent of or you know the beginning of a new approach to understand the societies in transition uh, was basically done through uh, the new uh, methodological innovations which had been done in particular particularly in the discipline of sociology and anthropology known as structural functionalism and the system theory. Now Almond and Powell and many other Sidney Bharwa and uh, so many other you know uh, social political scientists uh, in uh, United States of America, they basically uh, brought these perspectives uh, in their writings 
and try to analyze and understand these societies which were in transition society like India. But, but basically you know what uh, was most significant in those approaches was uh, you know the classification and the differentiation which was sought to be made in terms of the modernity transition a modernity tradition modernity dichotomy which was prevalent in uh, sociology and anthropology and the same tradition modernity dichotomy was you know refined conceptually refined and put into the new framework of analysis uh, in the discipline of public administration as well. So, therefore, what happened at the post second world war period we have had number of approaches from this perspective whether it was it in fact one can say it was a behavioral revolution within the public administration. But at the same time the 60s started with further refinement in these approaches and therefore you had you know people like Fred Briggs and many others who tried to you know bring new concepts new categories to understand the administrative climate the administrative uh, administrative environment of uh, you know these uh, developing countries and thereby they try to you know provide a you know a framework to understand uh, the, the transitional flux uh, in the countries which were known as the developing world. But in fact this uh, entire post second world war period uh, witnessed these changes, but public administration as a discipline had uh, you know a different beginning. In fact, it started uh, one can say in modern times with the industrial revolution and uh, with the you know the entire administrative challenges which were coming to the modern uh, state system in the west. The public administration as a you know bran branch of uh, knowledge uh, may have started with industrial revolution, but that does not mean that the earlier uh, you know societies or earlier state systems did not have any understanding of uh, you know this art of governance. In fact, even in India uh, someone like Cotill uh, who wrote uh, a treatise uh, on administration to the title of the book was Arthasast, but uh, there are many uh, dimensions of administrations which are captured in his that famous treatise on uh, you know on economy and society. Yes, similarly, in other you know the ancient Greek period in fact you have had number of thinkers who engaged with this issue, but modern times I mean this entire modern period brought new issues before uh, you know the, the, the community uh, intellectual community uh, of the west and uh, when the social science became a new you know acquired a new identity became a you know a separate autonomous knowledge system then I think gradually uh, the social scientists came to terms with or started addressing the concerns and the problems which were coming to them from uh, the challenges which were emerging due to the industrialization of the society. Therefore, I mean in public administration as we know this entire politics administration dichotomy discourse you know associated with the name of Wilson uh, in fact uh, started on this note because the urge at that time was to make this discipline more scientific a discipline which can basically ensure uh, three things uh, you know efficiency, economy and effectiveness. First of all the efficiency because you know the industrial revolution on the one hand uh, led to explosion in production, but at the same time it also required that the entire management of that production process should be efficient. So, that no waste is, uh, is done. Then the economy, the economy of a scale, the economy, econo how to economize the expenditure was another major issue and similarly the efficiency whatever is done should be done efficiently. So, these three concerns and then the overall urge to make this entire enterprise more scientific because the entire uh, climate was characterized by the new mood that was, the, uh, that was determined by the scientific revolution of the age. So, this scientific urge to make this discipline more scientific led to number of changes, refinements you know and uh, intellectual churnings and therefore, one can say that public administration had its beginning or in modern time uh, you know on this note. But then that was not the end of it because the industrial revolution uh, put the entire uh, western society on the path of a new trajectory of development, but then at the same time uh, you know in course of time uh, new challenges started coming 
and accordingly the responses also came forth responses from uh, you know the community of uh, political scientists because at that time public administration did not have any separate identity within the university system it was part and parcel of public and uh, political science uh, and political science continues to be or at least you know in some respect still uh, is a parent discipline for uh, public administration. So, the political scientists definitely and uh, you know uh, and naturally because you know the challenges were coming so accordingly they tried to basically diversify their approaches and in the meanwhile the challenges acquired new dimensions because now the entire uh, you know the, the experience was no longer confined to the developed industrialized world uh, you know society of the west with the expansion of international community with the decolonization with the advent of the third world countries the developing countries new experiences were being encountered and with this encountering of the new experiences i think the earlier theories the earlier models the frameworks were showing their limitation so accordingly the refinements were taking place new theorizations were taking place and in that process as we have seen that you know the behavioral revolution the structural functional the system theory all these developments uh, came to the fore but uh, still the public administration worked with one predominant uh, you know uh, the theory or premise which basically was derived from the weberian discourse and that was that pertained to bureaucracy because public administration have uh, you know has had number of uh, you know uh, diversifications has had number of forms uh, but uh, one thing was common in all of them that it is after all the management of the administration and particularly the public administration not the private because the private and the public this distinction was very significant in public administration but so far the public management is concerned the public administration is concerned it has to be done through the instrumentality of the bureaucracy so bureaucratic model was perhaps the most dominant model within the public administration and the high priest of this uh, entire discourse was max weber the german sociologist so in fact this bureaucratic model was transported to different parts of the world as the only model available through which these societies who were aspiring to you know catch up with the industrialized world you know societies of the west they had to basically rely on this model if they really if they were serious to uh, do certain things for example increase their productivity you know to 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 basically attain the growth in economy and then uh, to basically feed uh, the people the underprivileged people the starving people because this society was characterized by poverty malnutrition underdevelopment and uh, you know so on and so forth so this bureaucratic model was a dominant model now it existed in the west to great extent but one can say that west in fact when we talk of west there was not a monolithic west in terms of this uh, entire experimentation with this public administration you have had two three different routes through which you know this discipline of public administration brought new experiences and new responses uh, within the discipline one route was anglo american route which one can say was more people centric uh, more decentralization uh, you know uh, you know based in fact uh, it uh, believed in the people's sovereignty the general will uh, people's general will the mass participation these were the important concerns of this uh, you know anglo american discourse on public administration for example the united states of america made number of innovations deviated from uh, other western countries when it basically uh, talked about checkmating power the absolute power because this dictum that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely perhaps uh, struck them and therefore they always try to checkmate power and therefore you have had the innovations like separation of power you had have you have had the you know the innovation institutional and uh, theoretical innovations like federalism federalization of power the decentralization and then uh, you know the judicial uh, scrutiny of legislative acts or judicial you know basically control of administration uh, and uh, the legislature so all these basically innovations were meant to checkmate power 
that power should not be left unbridled because unbridled power can lead to authoritarianism and can basically harm the people's interest, the interest of the citizens and ultimately the democracy uh, is uh, basically you know stands for uh, the empowerment of the people. So therefore that empowerment means that people should have the voice, the people should have their say and their role in the decision making process and how to ensure that was perhaps one of the uh, you know concerns of the Anglo-American discourse more so in case of United States of America than perhaps uh, the, the Britain. But then there was another route that route was the French route which was basically uh, less people centric and more uh, you know state centric. In fact, uh, this entire bureaucracy which was transported to country like India uh, many people also and in, that is true in fact it is basically uh, the f uh, in fact the offshoot of or one can say the child of uh, the French Bonapartist system. I mean the system which was characterized by uh, strict rules, uh, distrust towards people's power, a, a kind of discourse which was which had immense faith in centralized control, in fact detested decentralization. So I think that was another route, the French route. The third route was the German, the Prussian route. So in one can say that there were two, three models, the examples, the experiences in the West. Therefore, when we talk of the public administration in the West, it is basically a misconception that there was a monolithic West. In fact, West itself was divided into three uh, different uh, sectors in terms of the experiences and in terms of uh, their you know, responses uh, to, to, to re respond to those challenges. But in fact, when it came to India, uh, when, when it came to country like India, I mean the entire uh, the third world countries, in fact, the public administration underwent further transformation in the sense that on the one hand, this Cold War politics influenced the political scientists of the West because they tried to basically ideologically take the battle to the third world and to convince the third world, the emerge, you know, the new emerging nations of the third world that what implied by development, what meant by growth, what meant by uh, you know uh, self-sufficiency. So all these things which were basically uh, the buzzword in the third world uh, political discourse at that time because a developing country, underdeveloped country, in fact these countries had to uh, basically address these concerns, the concern of underdevelopment, the concern of poverty and so on and so forth. So basically these developed uh, countries and their political scientists, their scholars, their social scientists were trying to impress upon uh, the intellectual community, the political class in these, these countries, the developing countries that they should basically follow a western path of development and what was meant by this western path was basically uh, uh, tried to be uh, presented, you know they tried to present it in form of number of theoretical propositions. For example, structural functionalism was one that how the differentiation of institutions and differentiation of structures can lead to the delivery of social and political goods, even the economic goods. So basically this entire structural functional approach has to be seen in that perspective. But at the same time one cannot deny that on the one hand these western social scientists were busy providing these developing countries with the new formulae. I mean the new package of knowledge, the ideas about dealing with administration. On the other hand, the political class in the developing countries itself was seized of the matter, was trying to address some of these concerns. For example, a uh, person like Nehru, the Prime Minister of India, and Kurma of Ghana, the Nayare, you know, these political leaders who had uh, both an inclination for uh, intellectual activity as well as their engagement with day to day governance provided them in a you know in a special situation where they could basically rise to the occasion where they could address some of the challenges the concerns which were emerging in the developing countries and they did, they discovered very soon that some of the approaches which were coming to them from the western world those approaches were not sufficient not adequate to deal with their own challenges. Therefore, it was the beginning of a new perspective in public administration.
Now, there are the, there are number of uh, experimentations. For example, in India, entire discourse of the mixed economy, the commanding height, you know, this uh, welfareism of a different sort, all these socialist pattern, socialistic pattern of society, these were the terms which were given for the new path, the new route which was taken to, uh, you know, to, to meet the challenges and to, to basically accomplish the agenda which they had set for themselves. But whatever the name was given to, I mean, these uh, you know, discourses, but one thing is very clear that the developing countries like India on the one hand rejected totally this western uh, prescription and on the other they try to uh, you know to to develop a new framework a new framework of governance a framework which had important content of uh, democratic ideas because after all the people's aspiration in these countries were not only for growth and production but also for redistribution and representation Therefore, the two important variables in this discourse were number one democracy which implied participation and representation and number two was socialism which implied redistribution, redistribution and justice. So, I think this entire public administration and the discourse in the developing countries in hands of these, these leaders, I mean uh, under uh, went a total metamorphosis a total trans transformation and accordingly one can say that public administration entered into a new phase and that phase can be seen having its repercussion in the first world as well in the developed world as well and that is why what one finds that the beginning of the comparative public administration and the entire discourse of development administration in the west which started in 1960 with Edward Wedner and uh, many other you know thinkers of public administration uh, and uh, to some extent one can say that the entire beginning of the new public administration associated with the name of Waldo of 1968 and kept on uh, getting redefined re and basically uh, reformulated and uh, we find that number of new concerns were added from efficiency, economy and effectiveness of the scientific era in public administration, we find that you know the entire discipline moved in direction of uh, relevance, uh, the prior, you know prioritizing values, and uh, you know uh, and a clamor for equity and change. So these four new terms, the new key concepts in this era of new public administration, uh, relevance that. Uh, entire enterprise has to be done in terms of its relevance or how it is relevant for the people. Then values, you cannot you know throw the values out of the entire enterprise because after all the public administration is administration which deals with people and the people have values. So, you cannot make it so objective that entire subjectivity is lost. So, value preference is important, positing values is important dimension without values no administration, no administrator can function in on the ground. Similarly, the equity after all, the, unless there is a equity in society, unless the, there is a equitable distribution of resources, unless there is a equal equality before the law, I think the public administration cannot acquire legitimacy in the eyes of the people. And finally, if the public administration has, ha, has to have, you know, has to show its meaning to the people, it is to be a change oriented exercise it cannot be a status quoist, it cannot function as if uh, you know uh, it is an agency just to legitimize or glorify the status quoism. So, these four words, the key words, the key variables of the new era, I mean new public administration were reminiscent of what was happening in the countries like India in the 40s and the 50s without having any reference to. Uh, these theoretical developments in the discipline of public administration, but these things were happening on the ground because I, as, I, as I mentioned that the two things which basically influence the mindset of the people and their political class was the re representation and participation and the redistribution of resources. Therefore, democracy and the socialism became the most attractive uh, you know concepts to the people in this part of the world and accordingly the political class
also basically uh, responded to these challenges under this framework. The framework which was on the one hand tilting towards socialism on the other hand was continuously talking about democratic participation. For example, when we talk of India, we find that in 50s, India's Prime Minister Nehru experimented with number of things and the three things are very significant. The entire cooperative movement which he visualized, it was neither the commune system of Soviet Union or you know the community ownership as the China was trying to do, nor it was a purely the market centric uh, discourse of resources which the you know the first world or the developed world of the west like United States of America, Britain and many other countries were uh, talking of. So, this entire cooperative movement had a democratic content in it, but at the same time the community ownership, the collective ownership also symbolized the urge of the people in this part of the world for the redistribution and for the community and the collective ownership of resources, which was totally different from the individual ownership, which uh, you know uh, uh, raised number of uh, you know dots and uh, number of uh, questions in the minds of the people. So, therefore, this cooperative movement, the community development program which ultimately graduated into the Panchayati Raj system was another similar experiment. Now, uh, uh, you know, so number of things which Nehru tried to do at that time symbolized this type of mindset that how participation, uh, representation and redistribution had to be continuously and constantly addressed if the people's aspirations uh, were to be met. And therefore, uh, what we find that countries like India started experimenting with them in 40s and 50s, but the discipline of public administration also you know addressed these concerns subsequently under new public administration and comparative public administration. Now, coming to the later part of uh, you know uh, of the debate, what we find that the 60s for the public administration was a very creative and innovative period because we have seen number of uh, theoretical uh, developments, number of frameworks emerged, number of ideas uh, came up which tried to basically rethink the entire strategy which was there within the discipline to understand not only the western world, but also the new nations of the uh, you know uh, of the Asia, Africa and Latin America. But the 90s started on altogether a different note because the 90s was the period when the cold war ended and with the end of cold war there was some sort of you know arrogance of power on the part of the first world particularly the united states of america which was the only superpower left at that time and that arrogance led to some sense of self you know congratulatory uh, ideas a kind of uh, you know uh, complacency developed that what was existing in the West perhaps was the best and therefore, you have had the book or the discourses like end of history uh, by Fukuyama and many others the class of civilization Huntington and so many other people uh, came on the scene and they started uh, glorifying what was existing in the West. So, basically that also heralded a new era where in, in fact, you know all new thinking the new innovations the new uh, you know concepts were being shunted out and an attempt was being made that what was existing perhaps was the best. But 90s at the same time for the developing countries was a very trying period because their earlier models of development uh, ran into series of uh, crises. For example, the entire uh, Nehruvian discourse in India, the centralized development, the state centric planning process all of them ran into crisis and not only India, but many other countries who like India were trying to do like this were also in trouble. For example, uh, you know the entire uh, Eastern uh, bloc which was uh, you know the allies of the Soviet Union uh, who also believed in a different type of development, but not the western one they also collapsed. So, I think this 90s started on a peculiar note on the one hand there was the delegitimization of the alternative path of uh, administration. On the other hand, there was a complacency and a kind of uh, you know a, a kind of uh, 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 self-congratulatory uh, uh, you know feeling uh, 
in the first world uh, you know intellectual community particularly uh, those who were uh, you know busy doing this exercise of public administration so that was the 90s now coming to the 90s what we find that two type of uh, developments took place in 90s one was that this crisis led to a new churning and this new churning was basically forcing the people to think in terms of uh, adopting the models that uh, and particularly uh, the framework which was being uh, you know handed uh, down by uh, the world bank and the imf in name of good governance because what happened that this crisis forced them to approach the imf and the world bank for uh, you know the assistance and in uh, you know uh, and when they approached this world bank and imf for assistance they gave assistance but that, that was a conditional assistance the conditionality was that they had to do certain changes in their entire administration they had to do changes in the entire management of their economy and this entire conditionality came to them as a structural adjustment program prescribed by the world bank now this structural adjustment program uh, which many of these countries adopted uh, ha was a basically a combination of number of things but the most important thing was that downsizing the state because the earlier uh, ex you know experience or the earlier model with which they worked was basically a state centric model of development in which the state had tremendous uh, role to play in the economy in fact the major space in the economy was being occupied by the states institutions so now the first important you know conditionality imposed by this world bank imf was to downsize the state i mean to roll back the state from the economy so it was the beginning of a new you know era for these countries and in other words one can say that it was the beginning of a period in which for the first time these countries were getting exposed to the market process or market mechanism as it is normally understood so the beginning of market mechanism downsizing of the state and at the same time number of other prescriptions which were handed down to them by the imf and the world bank led to a new churning and this churning had uh, you know its implications or impact at the three levels of governance because now from government the entire discourse uh, you know moved in direction of governance and this term governance implied not only a state and administration but also the market and the civil society so at the three levels three layers of you know management of resources management of the people so basically state civil society and the market and then the problem was that how to manage uh, entire thing at the three levels because there were two three important issues in this number one the chances and the possibilities of exclusions and then the basically the attempt to include people at all three levels then the another challenge was the challenge of transparency or one can say this entire uh, issue of corruption that how to uh, regulate these things so that the chances of corruption or the corrupt practices are minimized now uh, so basically this uh, good governance discourse after a structural adjustment good government you know good governance discourse came very soon uh, once the structural adjustment program was put into operation and therefore the world bank now uh, started shifting the gear from the structural adjustment to good governance and these countries were also following the shoot so 90s for example country like india we have had you know the new economic policy associated with narsimha rao manmohan singh uh, you know uh, regime and then finally the government changed but the policies continued and this is how we entered into a new phase of our public administration discourse in india now public administration from the very beginning has been hammering on this issue of administrative reforms because if you have a uh, you know huge state structure then it has to rely on bureaucracy and if the bureaucracy has to deliver then it has to be continuously reformed from inside so administrative reforms 
was there even earlier that is why in 1968 you had the first administrative reforms commission, but some of the recommendations are yet to be implemented. But the first administrative reform commission came in 1968, whereas the second administrative reform commission came with the beginning of the this era of new economic policy. What it implies that after 30 years or more than that, the state or the political class for the first time realized the importance of reforms again that unless administration is reformed, in fact, it cannot deliver the good. Now, the only difference was that the first phase of administrative reforms was meant to basically expand and make the state all pervasive, so that the state's presence people can feel and to facilitate the democracy or the democratic process in such a way that democracy and economic aspirations they go hand in hand. But the second phase of administrative reforms had altogether different mission it was to make administrative machinery more professional, more managerial, so that it can compete with the market. Its efficiency should be at the same level as, as we have the efficiency in the market. So, entire mission was transformed, the entire purpose was different and therefore, the second administrative reforms commission we find that some of the recommendations if one looks at those recommendations, it becomes very clear that how the second administrative reform commission has basically are set the target before it keeping in mind the new problems, the new challenges, the new concerns which are basically impinging on the political class, the concerns which are largely emanating from the market and its agencies. So, therefore, now this uh, 90s onwards particularly after 2000 we find that the Indian uh, discourse in public administration is basically showing a proclivity a inclination to take up those issues which the developed countries of the world uh, of the west have also taken up. It has started there in 80s with the you know the Thatcherism and Reaganomics which basically was influenced by the idea of Friedman and Hayek which is known as neoliberal policies. Now, the neoliberal policies of the west were finally institutionalized and got a more you know theoretical and uh, more systematic formulations in the hands of the World Bank and IMF. So, we can see a kind of convergence between the first and the third, I mean the first world and the third world uh, discourse in public administration in 2000 onwards or 90s onwards after the cold war. This convergence is largely on the issue of the three agencies in the society, the state, the market and the civil society that how three of them have to be more regulatory, have to be more you know effective, they have to be more transparent because transparency is also one of uh, you know the, the, the one of the issues with which they are continuously engaged with. Now, coming to this issue of the good governance, the issue of uh, you know a state uh, market and the civil society what we find that there is one important uh, feature of this entire development in country like India, which is not as prominent in the developed countries of the west as it is prominent in the developing countries like India and that is perhaps this democratic you know churning, the entire democratic aspirations of the people. Because what we find that not only efficiency not only growth because Indian uh, entire enterprise was basically characterized by uh, a clamor for growth and the growth because it was believed and during Nehru's time and perhaps to some extent uh, there was some merit into it because they thought that without growth, growth there cannot be redistribution. If there is there has to be redistribution then first of all there has to be productivity there has to be growth otherwise you will be only redistributing poverty. So, if you want to redistribute something tangible, if you want to redistribute prosperity then first of all let us have growth. So, growth was basically prioritized over all other concerns that was the 50s and the 60s, but then uh, you know the 70s the Indian discourse if in 50s was basically growth centric in 70s we find that this discourse moved in direction of redistribution.
and therefore we have had the beginning of the 70s on this note garibi hatao you know eliminate poverty now the 70s was redistribution 50s was growth 50s 60s was growth 70s was redistribution and then we find that 80s and particularly 90s onwards we have this inclusion so growth redistribution and inclusion the three key variables of indian discourse in you know administration one can see and its repercussions you can see in the politics its repercussions one can see in all intellectual churnings in the society in last 60 years so therefore this inclusion and redistribution the two important variables of the 70s and 90s are largely something which was which as we have seen initially constituted basically the ideological frame of the post colonial state in india that was socialism and democracy now this inclusion redistribution and inclusion now some of these concerns even the world bank and the imf uh, you know through their documents and through their policy prescriptions have tried to address and they at least claim that they are also for uh, these things transparency uh, you know accountability uh, a corruption free society uh, they want redistribution so that people are included at different levels of governance so on and so forth but you know the critics point out that it is too mechanical it is too institutional it is too managerial and therefore even if it talks of you know inclusion the inclusion is for inclusion sake it is institutional inclusion so basically inclusion uh, which should basically lead to the participation mass participation in decision making process is still a far cry uh, you know so far as this world bank uh, take on this issue is concerned so 90s and uh, you know onwards we find that the entire civil society uh, has been in the turmoil now this turmoil uh, can be seen in terms of the number of movements which were launched in india now these movements were for right to information the movement was for natural resources the movement was for empowerment for you know earlier this welfareist policies i mean the entire focus or entire slogan of welfareism that a state should uh, play the role of uh, a maibap i mean this kind of uh, uh, you know approach that patronizing approach of the state should be replaced by a more participatory more you know uh, enabling uh, discourse of uh, empowerment that people should be empowered in fact should be rights based not the welfare based welfareism but a right based discourse there is a people's in you know uh, the rights which inherit to them because they are human beings therefore it is their due in this democratic process that they should have all these things so we have had number of campaigns in the civil society on the issue of corruption anti corruption on the issue of livelihood on in, you know on issue of the protection of natural resources on the issue of displacement of the people the big dams that ultimately you know they started questioning that this development this growth is ultimately for whom and if it is going to displace the people for whom this entire exercise is being undertaken then this development has no meaning so i think that this uh, campaign in the civil society for inclusion and participation and now it is becoming a campaign for representation that no decision no policy formulation no you know major uh, you know action uh, policy action should be initiated without the consent of the people without the representation of the people because the representation the beginning of the rep modern you know concept of representation in democracy was in uh, either europe when the slogan was given that no taxation without representation that unless we are consented unless we are consulted and our consent is taken no taxation should be imposed now the similar mood one can also discern today when the people are saying that no major decision about their future about their fate about their livelihood about their life can be taken without basically soliciting or seeking their consent so this entire issue of representation has basically uh, come to the center stage so far the civil society is concerned on the other hand the state is also 
seized of the matter that how to regulate the market because some of the issues which have emerged in the civil society are directly linked to the malfunctioning and the distortions in the market process the market mechanism the working of the market on the two two types of problems we have witnessed on account of the market one is the failure of the market another is the risk involved in the market the failures we can see that number of failures in terms of its functioning on the other hand the risk involved so both have led to a, a kind of uh, you know a kind of encroachment on the people's right one can say to some extent one can say this is an exclusion of the people so if you want to checkmate the exclusion and if you want to ensure their inclusion then the first important thing is that this market and its distortions in terms of the failure and the risk have to be addressed so number of regulatory mechanisms have been put into place from you know electricity to number of things that these are the regulatory mechanisms i mean that they will regulate the functioning of the market but we have seen that all regulatory mechanisms have also been under crisis particularly recently you have seen that in india how this corruption has you know acquired this headlines particularly uh, when it comes to the regulatory mechanisms because in spite of these regulatory mechanisms we have we have seen in case of 2g spectrum and other similar scams that how the regulatory mechanisms have been taken to task because their failure are largely responsible for these uh, corruption cases so i think this uh, state uh, entire endeavor to regulate the market through these mechanisms have come to a not because in spite of these regulatory you know um, mechanisms and laws in place still uh, we are basically faced with a situation where uh, you know number of scams have been unearthed so therefore this is this transparency uh, and this issue of exclusion because if there is a corruption then that also implies the exclusion of the people and encroachment on their rights they have basically uh, been the most important problem being faced by the political class in last 20 years after the you know earlier model of uh, you know administration uh, was uh, replaced by the new model based on this uh, reliance and the faith on the market process and the market mechanism now this inclusive governance which the planning india's planning commission also talks of the plan document also talks of now this inclusive governance uh, is also perhaps on the agenda of uh, uh, of of uh, the world bank and the imf and also perhaps uh, the states uh, declared uh, mission the priority that that everyone should be included in this process but the question is as i was trying to point out earlier that inclusion what way which way this inclusion is to be uh, you know attained one is this managerial mechanical institutional inclusion which is basically more liberal in its orientation and this is perhaps the model through which uh, the world bank and imf try to uh, you know attain this goal there is another inclusion which is more people friendly more people centric and that is perhaps and its root lies uh, in the democratic ideas uh, basically democratic discourse or one can say the popular will uh, you know uh, popular will the people's uh, you know uh, sovereignty and in fact as it was propounded uh, in the tradition of uh, civic you know uh, in the republican tradition uh, right from the days of uh, rousseau so therefore and uh, even in india we have had number of uh, you know indian thinkers who talked in these terms from uh, gandhi uh, to you know uh, to ambedkar m n roy many of them talked of people's participation uh, in fact particularly ambedkar letter ambedkar not uh, the earlier one but the letter ambedkar uh, dwelt on this issue when he uh, basically discovered that the institutional politics uh, was not taking the entire you know democratic enterprise to any uh, you know definite uh, uh, destination now therefore what we find that this inclusion inclusive governance though is in circulation but it has two different meanings one meaning is coming from uh, the neo liberal uh, you know uh, discourse of world bank and imf and another is coming emanating from the society the civil society one can say among from the people and this uh, implies a more proactive 
uh, approach towards participation and representation. Now, there are two, three problems uh, you know uh, on account of this. The first problem is that on the one hand in order to uh, in order to uh, basically regulate the market in the state, uh, you know in recent times we have seen that uh, there has been a continuous uh, uh, experimentation with certain institutions, certain you know agencies uh, you know which are non representative in character, because ultimately this regulates regulation of market or the state uh, require some expertise some skill and those skill and expertise basically make it a non representative uh, in its in their character. For example, whether it is the judicial uh, review or judicial scrutiny or judicial activism what has come to us as judicial activism, I mean that is also a non representative uh, you know agency through which uh, both three you know all, all these three things the market state and civil society are regulated. So, judiciary is one then you have many other you know non representative characters uh, non representative agencies from media to some uh, specialized committees and commissions the entire model of delegated legislation of the parliament because the parliament is supposed to legislate but the way it legislates it relies heavily on the bureaucracy because ultimately it is the bureaucracy which assists the legislators in the exercise of legislation and this delegated legislation is itself an example of the instance of you know non representative character of uh, you know of regulation. So, therefore, this uh, regulation through non representative character has also become a bone of contention. So, far as this uh, the people's urge for uh, participation representation and inclusion is concerned. So, now this is a big tangle I mean this is a big dilemma that on the one hand you have to regulate on the other hand how to regulate, regulate through representative institutions or regulate through non representative institutions. If the expertise is required, a skill is required, if more effective regulation is required then one has to at some level rely on non representative institutions and this is perhaps one of the important uh, you know criticism of the Lokpal uh, the entire campaign for the Lokpal because Lokpal ultimately is to be uh, you know a body which is uh, which has to you know uh, you know which which would consist of people who would be expert in their areas but not necessarily representative of the people and therefore a lot of people feel that this entire body of Lokpal would be super superintending on uh, on the you know representative bodies like parliament and therefore it will be undercutting uh, undercutting uh, the representative uh, you know character representativeness of indian democracy so therefore it is not only this agency of lokpal but we have seen in case of judiciary we have seen in the case of media we have seen in case of the other regulatory bodies which are to regulate the market from sebi to you know to the, the, the you know electricity regulatory mechanism to you know number of things every uh, you know every in fact important issue which is being dealt with the market is uh, you know uh, guided by some regulatory authority and that regulatory authority is also non representative in character. So, therefore, this class of the two different concepts the two different ideas in this discourse on administration one is that how the people's aspiration for representation for participation and inclusion. Uh, is to be met on the other hand how these challenges are to be you know taken up and how these uh, entire uh, process to be regulated. If the process is to be regulated through non representative agencies then the people's rights and their uh, you know uh, rights and their participation would be curtailed at some level. So, this important issue is basically acquiring a new uh, dimension in today's context in the discipline of public administration and it has to address these issues if it has to basically operate within the framework of democratic governance. So, in a way uh, administration is also, also changing and resilient to the aspiration of the people. And exactly, it has to be because otherwise you know the administration is ultimately meant to fulfill the aspirations of the people.
Okay. And if it is cut off from those aspirations, then it cannot have the legitimacy. Mm -hmm. Now, the earlier administration, earlier period, the administration acquired legitimacy because it, it basically promised mm -hmm. a more effective growth, more affluence for the people. Okay. Because as I mentioned, the redistribution without growth was believed to be, you know, redistributing only poverty. Mm -hmm. So the growth was mandatory. But once that era was over, now administration has to the has to address the concern of the people in terms of their aspiration for participation, for representation, for their inclusion, because they are not simply contented by growth. They also want something more in a particularly a democratic order. So I think this is one challenge, one dilemma, and this discipline of public administration has to rise to this occasion, has to rise to this occasion to address, address this concern. So, well, friends, we hope that uh, these things will be taken care of uh, in coming days and naturally a new sort of the things will emerge and finally class and the in interest of the uh, different so uh, section of society will be fulfilled by the administration. So, with word, uh, we conclude the lecture and thank all of you for watching the lecture. And on behalf, I thank Dr. Satish Jha for giving such an insightful lecture on this very topic. Thank you very much. Thank you.